Anyway, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Like, I haven't spoken in front of actual people in so long. I don't know if anyone else speaks at conferences and stuff like that, but like, standing in front of a camera trying to be excited is a nightmare. Trying to like understand what the audience is thinking or whatever. I mean, you have no idea. Also, I'm holding a. Beer. It's really awkward to hold a beer when you're recording. <laughs> people are like, that guy did that at like nine in the morning, right? <laughs> so I'm just really excited to be here. Anyway. Uh, cool, so I'm Rob, CTO of CircleCI, we got that covered. All right, cameras are good, I don't know, I, well, wait. All right, everything's good? Oh, look at that. So, a um, couple true stories. In the fourth grade, I had this teacher who was like obsessed with the weather. So, also I say fourth grade, do people say fourth grade here or grade four? I'm not really sure. I'm Canadian, like I, get, I say all these like weird things and people catch me all the time. So uh, he was obsessed with the weather, like spent the whole year teaching, trying to teach us everything we were supposed to learn in that grade by teaching us about the weather, which I thought was really painful then, but now as someone who loves the outdoors uh, and also loves our planet, I'm quite interested in the weather. And, uh, and so Nick asked me to speak and I was like, well, what do you want me to talk about? I, I'll talk about anything. So he sent some random titles over and I was like, cool, I'll pick that one. Because I love a good analogy also. If anyone hasn't read the book Range, very good, deep thinking about analogies. And the only problem is I totally nerd out on analogies, right? Like I'm like, oh, why do people say this is a barometer, right? Like why is this a barometer for shipping? Oh, what does that mean exactly? So uh, I almost didn't make it here today because I was digging so deep on like barometric pressure models. But I want to start by defining some terms. Also, it's the kickoff, right? This is the inaugural meetup. So I get to define all the terms that y'all are gonna use for every meetup after this. They'll all be as I said they were. Um, so what is a barometer? I mean, who doesn't want an open pool of mercury sitting around their house? That's the first question, right? But the concept of a barometer is basically measuring air pressure, right? So there's surface pressure down on this thing and it pushes up in a tube through a vacuum, whatever. I mean, you can see this cool diagram that I stole off the internet. Uh, I was just really excited about the open surface of, of mercury. Uh, there's lots of other ways that you can do this now, but what I think is really interesting about barometers is you're usually not measuring something that you care about, right? Like when we think about the weather, we think about, I should look over there, it's way easier, I'm not, I won't look away from me. We think about this, right? Like uh, we were just talking about snowboarding earlier, I happen to spend lots of time in Tahoe, so when I think about that, like I care what's the temperature, is it gonna snow, right? But speaking of nerding out, the way that we actually get there is by looking a lot deeper, right? So this is, a, this is a pressure map of basically North America this Friday, as projected, right? And for anyone who doesn't know, but well, actually you probably have all figured out that's very dry right now. That giant red bubble right there, like that's high pressure preventing anything from coming off the coast, right? It's preventing cold air from coming down and it's preventing wet from coming in. And those two things are what makes storms, right? That's what makes our snow. And so the people that are actually trying to figure out if it's gonna snow or not are not looking on the, well, they were the ones that gave the information to the iPhone app, right? They're looking at stuff like this and they're trying to figure out what's gonna happen. The good news is on Monday, this is what it's gonna look like. And this is a giant channel for cold air to come flowing down from the north, right? Unfortunately, there's nowhere for the precipitation to come in. Oh, and for anyone who doesn't know, this probably won't show up on the video, but that's Tahoe, that little like nook in the corner of California, the lake is like right there circled by mountains. So this is what we think about. And so what's also interesting about pressure, right? One, when I think about the analogy to software delivery, it's not something that you actually understand or even feel, right? Like, do you think you would notice a difference of 10, what are these, microbars? No, probably not, right? Do you ever go outside and you're like, oh, I think it's a few microbars lower than it was yesterday, or millibars or whatever, those are like, no. Nobody even understands what that means. But this drives everything, right? Two, no, like no one really knows what to do with it, but it's, it's part of this big complex system. And then finally, the thing that's most interesting in this measurement is change, right? When it's changing, that's when exciting things are happening. And I always wanna think about what's changing in my measurements. So now let's talk about productivity. I love these words that we use, we use productivity, efficiency, whatever, all the time, we throw them around. And, uh, and I, so I'm actually, first of all, not a computer scientist, I studied engineering physics. And so efficiency is like something you talk about all the time, right, thermodynamics, electronics, all these things, efficiency really matters. 
And so when I talk about those things, I think about waste in systems and stuff like that. But I think when engineers hear productivity, they hear, oh, like you're measuring me in a spreadsheet, right? Like how many hours am I going to be in the office? Like did I produce enough lines of code kind of thing? And so I think it's really interesting to dig into this. In fact, I try to look it up. There's uh, 275 million results on the difference between productivity and efficiency. They're all crap. Like none of them say anything useful or interesting. There's all this theory about like this is how many hours you work and this is what you got done in an hour. Like who cares, right? What do we care about when we're trying to build software? We care about value delivered to the customer, right? So there's something about all these terms and the way that we think about them from a management perspective that's honestly like a little bit nuts. I can't think of a better description. But people are super stoked to tell you their opinion. You should definitely go read all these links. They're super. I read like five of them and I was like, I don't know what any of this says. It doesn't make any sense. But again, as a physicist like this, I understand, right? I have energy. I'm putting energy into the system. I'm running through some process. And then energy comes out, right? Something of value comes out. And this, this is bad. This is waste, right? Like, you know, somewhere in this country, we're burning coal, turning that into electricity, right? Through a bunch of systems of turbines or whatever. And like, what do we burn coal and boil water and turn like spin a turbine, turn that into electricity, you know, whatever. Like, I don't need to go through the whole process. Comes to your house as electricity and then turns on your little block heater. And then you're trying to stay warm based on that. Like you would be a lot warmer if you were sitting next to the coal, right? But that doesn't, we can't, we can't just distribute the coal all over the place. So we lose, right? We lose stuff in the system and we're trying to make the system more efficient. And from a developer perspective, as we're trying to do work every day, there's waste, right? There's a lot of waste, lots of things. Well, one, we build things we don't need, like notification platforms. You're welcome. Do I get, do I get paid later? <laughs> right? Like we do stuff. We build things we don't need. We maybe build things that our customers don't want, like start identifying the, the places where there's waste in the system. And I think you start to understand what you really want out of efficiency, which is we're doing a lot of work. What are we getting out of the other side of it, right? Are we getting value delivered to the customer? So that's how I think about efficiency. And honestly, the most interesting thing about that, you know, I talk about how engineers feel like, oh, I'm getting measured in a spreadsheet or whatever. Like as an engineer, when I feel like my time and energy is not being wasted, I'm much happier, right? I do better work. I'm not like futzing with process or dealing with you know, coordination overhead or whatever. I'm just getting stuff done. It feels good, right? All right, so now let's talk about shipping. I got three terms in the title. I got to define them all. Now, like I said, you got to use the exact same definition for the rest of this, the life cycle of this meetup. My definitions might be bad enough that you'll just start a different meetup, but. All right, so are people familiar with the DORA metrics? Yeah. Does everybody know what DORA is? Oh, how fascinating. Solver. What's that? Solver. Oh, I will. I will. I'm just trying to remember what DORA stands for. DevOps Research and something. Sorry, DORA. Uh, so there's a state of DevOps report that comes out quite regularly, a book that they, the folks behind this wrote called Accelerate that talks about the connection between business success and effective software delivery. And they were able to isolate through their research these four key metrics that they pay attention to as indicators of developer, I'll call it productivity. Basically, I think they call it IT effectiveness or something like that. And I always get a little squirrely when people refer to software development as IT, but we'll leave that for another day. Lead time for changes. And this is narrowed down in their definition to from the point that you commit code to the point that it's in production, right? So take a SaaS-centric view for a second. I don't think most of us work in SaaS, but if you're doing embedded systems, it's a little bit harder, right? Like, so from the point that you have actually built something, finished building, to the point that it's in the hands of customers, right? How long does that take? And the way that they break up their work is they look at quartiles effectively high performers, medium performers, low performers, I guess that's thirds, but I, I swear they do some of it in quartiles. It doesn't matter one way or another. So high performers are less than an hour. Low performers, you're talking in quarters, right? I don't know, I mean, I, I've been in this industry over 20 years, so it's not totally surprising, like I remember that, but the fact that people do that today is mildly terrifying to me. If you're in this room and you're spending multiple quarters to get completed code into production, come talk to me later. Did I mention that I'm from CircleCI? I think that was covered, right? <laughs> Deploy frequency. 
how often are you pushing changes into your production environment? I'm gonna stop acknowledge, acknowledging that this is SaaS centric, but how many times are you putting changes in front of customers, right? Is it you know, one big change? Like I think we all still know software companies that deliver a big release every quarter or something like that, or half year. Um, the, yeah, the, well, but if you look at their SaaS stuff, it's, it's coming out like much, much faster than that, right? So um, I actually have a, I have a chart with metrics with the, with the columns taken off or the axes taken off of our own deploy rates, but it's in hundreds of times per week for our organization, like multiple times per developer, which is a much more natural, uh, well, natural. It feels unnatural to get there, but once you get there, you're like, why did we ever do anything else, right? So that's value being delivered to customers. Mean time to restore, so at the point that you put something into production in front of a customer, there's something wrong with it. How long does it take to recover, to fix it? Um, and again, top performers are gonna be measured in minutes, like under an hour sort of thing. Low performers, still in months. I mean, the notion that you put something in front of your customers and it's broken and then months later you fix it for them is, I don't know. I don't know how to talk about that, but that's, that's the reality of the situation, right? Like large organizations are building software still in, in sort of older models that we're, um, we've probably experienced but don't love. And then change fail percentage. In some of my stuff, I talk about this as success rate because I just try to be a little more positive. But basically for all those changes, right? You're pushing out hundreds of changes, thousands of changes a week. How many times does something go wrong? Which as you can imagine is closely linked to mean time to restore, right? It's actually okay to push stuff out that's wrong if you can fix it quickly. If you push stuff out that's wrong, like if you do quarterly releases, there's probably always something wrong with it. And then it's another quarter before you fix it. Like you're in a constant state of brokenness. That's not necessarily a great place to be, right? So why is this an interesting set of things to look at from a, from a delivery perspective? I think of it like this. Like, I don't know if you can read that. Apologies if you can't, but it says ideation and planning on the left, right? I didn't go into the details and label everything. But to me, that is a chaotic system. I hope for your sake that it's slightly less chaotic, but ideas are coming from everywhere. Expectations are coming from everywhere. There's escalations, right? There's customer demands. There's this really important deal that we're gonna close, whatever it is. There's a bunch of different things happening here. So if you say, oh, like, from the point that I define something to the point that it's getting built, like sometimes we define stuff that doesn't get built, right? So what do you measure over here? And then once it gets out to the customer, it's chaos again. Every customer has a totally different need. Every customer is doing something different, right? Stuff works, stuff doesn't work. But through the middle, there's this really linear path, right? We finish writing the code, it goes, well, hopefully, it goes through a deployment pipeline, like a build pipeline, deploy pipeline, out into production. So the thing that's really interesting about this is everything has to go through there. It's the one spot that you can actually measure and say, okay, I see a correlation. Like if this is working well, then whatever chaos is happening over here is probably working okay. And whatever chaos is happening over here is probably fine, because we're at least able to get stuff out to customers. Right? So I, uh, I mentioned loving analogies. I, I kind of think of it like this. So I live in Oakland, right? And we're in San Francisco. You know that. There's just not that many ways. Like, to figure out how traffic is flowing from San Francisco to Oakland, I could go look at the Bay Bridge, and I'm going to get a really good understanding of it, right? But if I said, oh, how are people doing getting out of Golden Gate Park? Like, who cares? You, it's like you're never gonna like some people are going this way and some people are going that way and whatever but like okay there's the BART under there but ignore that everybody's getting on the Bay Bridge right really simple and then who cares like are you going to Lawrence Hall of Science or Children's Fairyland doesn't matter well it matters to me because I'm trying to go home and I live right by Children's Fairyland but this is what I can understand right and measure linearly and say oh, okay traffic's flowing well today oh traffic's terrible today Right? All this stuff can kind of deal with itself, but it's, it's sort of chaos here and chaos there. So actually having something that you can understand to then say, oh, okay, we're delivering software effectively is really valuable. But then the question becomes, all right, so let's talk about using numbers effectively. So now we have this constrained place where we can measure. It's great, but how do we think about those numbers? I'm gonna stop looking up there, sorry. It's just easier. Um, so I love this quote that I got from HBR. It's an article about what they referred to as, um, oh, what was the word? Well, we'll call it, oh, surrogation. The notion that you, 
start with a strategy, right? I mean, people have done this, OKR process, KPIs, whatever you all measure in your businesses, right? You start with a strategy and then you say, oh, we'll be realizing that strategy. We'll know it's working if we see these numbers move. And then we start focusing on the numbers and we do whatever it takes to make the numbers move and we've drifted away from the strategy, right? So the focus becomes the numbers as opposed to the thing that they're meant to represent. And this can totally, like, delivery pipelines are not company strategy, but they become what we focus on if we don't treat them properly, right? Like, yes, you can deploy more, but are you deploying stuff that's of value to your customers? That's the next important question to get to. So I said I had a, a un, like, whatever. This is Circle CI's deploys per week, basically, over the course of many weeks. I took all the labels off so that you don't know exactly what this is. Um, the green line is it bouncing up and down. The white line is the mean, most useless number on this chart, right? Like if anybody is, and it's actually interesting in the Dora metrics, one of the things I talk about is mean time to recovery. And so love time to recovery, I beg of you, don't focus on means, right? If you spend 20 minutes every time and then once you take four days to fix something, figure out what went wrong on the four day. Don't worry about the fact that your mean is 24 hours or whatever it works out to, right? You could spend a ton of time trying to fix those 30 minute, 20 minute issues. Think about what happened in the four hour case or the four day case or whatever it was, right? Um, and I tried to apply some smoothing just to see if that was helpful, right? Like what does a four week rolling average look like? But it doesn't tell me anything that I can't see just by looking at the chart. Did you have a question? Project definition doc process. I will, I will look that up. I'm sure I will be delighted. I'm confident. Thank you. Wait, so you. Watch the video and then and then we'll talk about it. Because I think you're gonna miss some of the, the key points. But thank you. Yeah. All right. So point is means, fairly useless. Distributions, interesting, right? Like I can see trends in there. First of all, I, I love like I'm a big fan of data science and analytics and really cool algorithms in ML, but 90% of the time I can just see it by plotting it on an XY axis or like a time series, right? Just look at it and go, okay, there's something interesting there. By the way, that massive dip is end of year holidays. That wasn't like, nothing terrible happened there. <laughs> you, just, you just expect it, right? Of course that happened. Oh, we all left. Nobody shipped anything. That's great, like that's a, that's a big plus, right? Like, cool, people took time off. Actually, why did we ship 90 times or whatever that is? Like, what was going on there? That feels bad. But, you know, some people probably had some side projects or whatever that they were working on. So, keep moving. Now, people familiar with S-curves? Some nods, but I'm obviously I'm gonna talk about it anyway. I'm just always curious. So this is an S-curve. I mean, it's named pretty smartly, looks like an S. Uh, and what it's meant to represent is real world constrained growth. Or actually, it's not really meant to represent. Where this pattern occurs all the time is constrained growth, right? So uh, th this is like, typical example would be population growth over time, right? So in this, kind of early phase, you're reaching critical mass, basically, right? Like, whether it's, if you pick a population of a particular species, it's going to have be fighting for survival and like struggling to get going, whatever, and then it reaches this point where it can grow unconstrained, right? We're the dominant species in this area, whatever we've established ourselves. But at some point, like, something else in the ecosystem prevents growth. It's resources, food availability, predators that uh, take a note, I, you know, whatever that might be, right? But this is how most growth patterns actually look. There's some, you know, early stage of getting going, actual growth, and then, you know, limited growth, basically. And so when we talk about metrics, take, like I'm using deploy frequency as an example, I think we all have this mental model that it looks like this, right? The bottom quartile is down here, top quartile over there, so this is like 25, 50, 75 percentile. And 
if we just keep working at it and investing, like we're gonna keep going. But the reality of the situation is, you have this big investment in like changing your culture, investing in tools, getting the things in place to say, no, it's really important. Like we care about deploy frequency. It matters. And someone in here is like, well, we're putting all this energy into it and we're not, it's not really moving the needle. So this is obviously a waste of time, right? So there's that whole battle that's happening down here. And then you finally start to get the results, right? And you're, you know, leveraging those tools and getting more people, like more teams on, depending on the size of your organization. People are buying into it, whatever. And then it, it taps out, right? Like when we look at, again, the top quartile or the high performers from Dora Metrics, all of our customers are in that bucket, basically, right? Like if you're using a cloud-provided CI, CD tool to deliver your software, you get it. You get that software delivery is important. You have an agile process. You've invested in that. Your culture is there. So we're up here, right? And this is like diminishing returns. How much more am I going to invest in trying to get, like we deploy, depending on the week, based on those numbers, like four-ish times per developer per week, right? That's like almost once a day. You got planning, you've got actual development time, you've got, you know, whatever. Like, imagine your life as a developer, there's a lot of things happening there. Deploying every day is like pretty solid, right? So what, what am I even gonna get if I keep chasing that number, right? If I deployed every hour, would that be useful? Like, oh, I, I typed a keystroke, so I feature flagged it, and I pushed it out into production. No one's going to use it. I mean, at some point, there's diminishing returns in what I'm even getting out of that, right? So I think, think like, and even this, you know, this kind of unbounded, this notion that we could deploy infinitesimally small changes, just isn't, isn't worthwhile to us, right? So if you end up chasing the numbers, well, this is investment, like this is just gonna be pure dollars at this point, right? Like I'm burning cash trying to move faster, but what return am I getting on it? So when I think about this, I think about these kind of sweet spots, right? So this is deploy, deploy rate, deploy frequency, and success. So I said I inverted the failure percentage, mostly because everybody when they draw a two by two wants their answer in the top right. So that I didn't wanna have it down the bottom, but I actually don't want to maximize deploy rate and success rate because, as I said, the cost increases as I go up into that corner, right? So if I spend, I'm, well, okay, business context awareness in there. We're, we are a critical service for our customers, so we care a lot about how close to the top we are on the success rate. If I was building self-driving cars, I would be even further up on the success rate. But even then, I, I have a website to sell my cars, right? Do I, do I have to be as critically like, severe in ensuring that every single deploy is perfect for that website? No, like if people can't do something, they can't see some image on the site, let's come back later, right? If the car forgets how to drive, like that's a really, really big problem. I can't, I can't put that out on like just deploy it, right? So, but then I'm gonna be comfortable with pulling down the rate. Right? That's what's going to allow me to manage the cost. Because if I have to keep shipping every day, I mean, nobody wants a car update every day. Do you want your car to be updated every day? I could, I'm, like, I've been driving the same car for a year. I still can't figure out what half the software does. Right? So I don't want updates every day. So for many businesses, it's going to be in here. It's this balance of how much am I willing to spend and how slow am I willing to, because driving up success is going to drive down deploy rate. Right? So there's some sense, and actually we use SLOs a lot as a way of managing, we as in CircleCI, but also we as in, the, like I think we figured it out in the software industry, as a way of having a real conversation with business stakeholders about what can we accept, right? Or can we accept a 1% failure rate or a 0.5%, whatever that is, if we can accept that, then we can keep pushing as hard as we can up to that boundary, because that's when we're going to innovate. And will, being willing to accept failure means that I'm willing to take chances and the chances are where I'm gonna find the innovation, right? Oh my gosh, this thing sometimes, it's all good, we'll get back to it. So also on the small, like deployment frequency, this is bad, right? Well, hopefully, 
people agree, generally? I don't know, I can't tell. Three months, six months to put out a giant change, unless, you know, again, let's discard the self-driving cars. When we talk about smaller increments of work, I think we often get stuck here, which is my goal is just to make the increment smaller, but I already know where I'm going, right? I'm gonna deliver a little bit of it at a time, and I'm gonna keep charging down the path. But the reality of the situation is we wanna iterate, right? We wanna put something out and get some feedback and then say, oh, look what customers are doing. Like, they like that part, but they don't like this part. Right, and so we thought we were going up to B, but we're actually going to C, and we can only figure that out because we put out these small bits, right? Like this is agility, right? This is just small chunks. I don't really know what to call that. Like reduce, this is a reduced batch size, but I've only reduced the batch and ignored the feedback. That's not actually being agile. It's not being responsive, right? So this is getting the feedback from my customers and then adapting and actually delivering something of value. So, you know, yes, it would have been great if I had gone in a straight line to see, but the reality of the situation is we're always wrong about something, right? This is where we find out. So if I try to go so fast from a deployment rate perspective that I don't have time to collect feedback or understand what customers are doing, then I'm gonna be charging up here. And the path to B and then back down to C where you throw out B is not a fun path, right? You don't wanna be on that path. So again, getting obsessed with the numbers will take you this way, paying attention to why you cared about those numbers, right? Which is I wanna get something out quickly so I can learn from my customers. That's what's gonna get you to the product that your customers actually want. I've given up on saying I'm not gonna look at the screen because these are pictures, you know, it's helpful. All right, so, so what happens when you, when you hit that top quartile, right? When you're in the top performer pool yeah, like, are you futzing with tooling, trying to make everything run a little bit faster so you can deploy a few more times a day? Maybe, it could help. But the thing about S-curves and the way that most people think about them is you actually wanna leave one and find the next one, right? Like, okay, we capped out on what we can do from maybe a tooling perspective to get ourselves deploy frequency. Let's talk about deploy frequency because it's just a good example. So what's next? And for me, this comes back to the point of why we're all doing this, right? Like, we're trying to put value in front of customers. Who's putting value in front of customers? Our software engineering teams with the help of product teams. Like, we are defining something, we're putting product in front of customer and we're increasing value in front of the customer, right? So, then it becomes about people. Like, the tooling's great and the tooling will help you get to a particular point, but at some point, it's about people. And so, this is like the worst. I totally just stole this off something. I, I literally added this picture like right before I ran over here. But uh, is anyone familiar with Daniel Pink, Drive? Okay, some nods. So Daniel Pink wrote this book, but you can just watch his, like everything else, you can just watch his TED talk and you don't have to read the book, it's great. On the concept that basically for a particular amount of, I mean it's sort of Maslow's Pyramid or whatever, like for a particular amount of return, the direct compensation for your work is what you care about, right? But when you get to complex work, knowledge work, like, I don't, this is probably, yeah. If you're in software, you're probably okay paying the rent, is what I would say at this point in this industry. So what you care about is fulfillment in your job, right? These intrinsic motivators that actually make exciting to do your work. And so he talks about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Whoever made this little, this is a retro that someone was doing on whether or not they had autonomy, mastery, and purpose in their, in their work, which is a really cool idea, actually. So I'll take that one, at least, from this. Uh, and they have autonomy problems. That's really clear on this board. So that's good to know. But the notion is those are, the, those are the key drivers from an intrinsic perspective that motivate people to show up and do work, right? And so it's actually to me, always intriguing that these numbers that we drive for around like, how many times did we deploy, how many times did we you know, succeed, whatever, are all interesting measures, they're indicators, right, going back to barometers, but they aren't necessarily what's motivating people. Like, and they're not the goal of the business, right? There's very, like, okay, we're a CICD business, so we are actually really motivated and excited about like numbers of deploys, but most people, that's not what they're doing, it's an indicator that it's working right, that there's low waste, that they're focused on the right things. And so autonomy, I mean, I can define the terms, but I'm pretty sure you all know them. Autonomy being the ability to actually own your stuff and get it done, right? 
if you think about all the people you have to talk to and all the coordination meetings that you have to go to and who you need approval from to get something done, right, do you have the context as an individual developer to actually drive forward, right? Do you have clarity to make good decisions and just go? Mastery, the ability to excel at your craft, right? Which is, again, I mean, different category, but you can maybe have all been in the place where someone's telling you how to actually do your job instead of giving you the space to learn and develop and get better. And then purpose, tying into the mission of the organization, right? Do I believe in what we're doing? Do I see how what I'm doing is connected to that? And do I feel that connection in the work that I'm doing? And if not, then it's like, I'm sort of checking the boxes and I'm sitting here, it's like, cool, whatever, I'm doing the stuff and I'm getting paid and it's fine. But these three things, in Daniel Pink's view, add up to, um, to intrinsic motivation. What's interesting to me, I, uh, I saw these exact three words in another book that I read called The Art of Impossible. I forget the author's name. It's a fantastic book on flow state and living in flow state. And so this is actually a term that we use all the time in software development. Unfortunately, we use flu flow to mean two totally different things. One is like delivery pipelines and how is work flowing in the system. The other is flow state, right? And if anyone's experienced the how is it three o'clock in the morning, I was just working on this thing and it was going so smoothly and I didn't have to pay attention to anyone else and I knew what I was doing and it was working and it was clicking, like that level of productivity, that to me is the next S, right? Like if it's great that we can all put in some number of hours in a day or whatever, but getting to that state and feeling this productive is what's gonna unlock the real potential in your, like yes, you got all the tooling in place, you have the culture, but then you have people who can actually individually get stuff, or paired, or in mob programming, or whatever, but like crank stuff out. Um, speaking of weather, and so topical, I think I mentioned snowboarding already. Still, for anyone who doesn't know, the Winter Olympics is on right now. Chloe Kim just won her second gold, right? She won 2018 as the youngest snowboarder ever to win. And as she was going into her gold medal run, the NBC announcer said, said these words, and I was like, oh yeah. So she's got this huge smile. She's had an absolutely terrible practice run. She has this just huge grin on her face, and the announcer's like, she's about to crush it and get gold. There's no way she's not gonna win, because you can see she's going into that state, right? That's flow state, it's just like, she pulls off these ridiculous tricks, and you're just like, how does anyone even do that? And she's not even thinking about it at that point, right? And so, it would be nice if we were all professional snowboarders, but when we sit down and work every day, having that level of connection with what we're doing is what really, to me, is that next level beyond like we have all the tools in place and our, you know, we're measuring great delivery pipelines. So when I think about the S of that, it's like, it takes work, real work, to build a culture, to set up the environment, tools are involved, but they're not everything, to give people the context they need in order to build and deliver and then you're up the curve. And then it taps out because people need to sleep, right? At some point, you, you can't just flow state forever. There you have to discover new stuff and stop and coordinate and whatever. But that realization is what really matters and that's all in human potential. Everything else is setting up the systems to allow you to get there. All right, that's all I got. Thank you very much.